Salutations once again to the Truth Corps, whoever and wherever you may be on the planet. Well, I wonder sometimes, if you wonder, what I'm doing when I'm not sitting here to record something. Well, lately, the last couple of weeks, I've been intensely immersed in revising Not in His Image. That book came out in November of 2006, so 2021 is the 15th anniversary. And we'll see. I have a tentative agreement with the publisher to bring out a revised edition, the 15th anniversary edition. So that's pretty intense. And I'm concentrating on that right now. Someone at the publisher, Chelsea Green, suggested that I might do a talk about the revision of Nihi and point to some of the changes that I and making due to what I have come to know and experience over the last 15 years. So who knows, that might show up one day or other on this channel. Also, it might amuse you to know that on a day-to-day -day basis, I have to exercise a kind of restraint so that I don't shatter from total intensity. It's odd because I call myself a Nahual, which simply means a shaman. None of the Gnostics were shamans. And a shaman is someone who negotiates power with the supernatural and also negotiates power with other human animals. When I talk to you, for instance, I'm actually transacting power. One way to see this is in the analogy of gaming. I've assigned various roles to myself throughout life, but I haven't done it in make-believe or in some kind of, what, indulgence of fantasy, some kind of LARPing with myself. It is a form of LARPing. Misophrenia is a practice that involves LARPing. So I've uh, called myself the Nahual, which is a legitimate expression of what I do. But bear in mind that the Nahual, the unknown, is something that cannot be restrained. Nevertheless, I do have to restrain myself. You could say I have to constantly gear down so I can handle the intensity of what's coming through me. Now, I just mentioned a gaming metaphor. Why did I bring that up? Well, that refers to another aspect of my LARPing. I also describe myself as a dealer, you know, like in a casino. And with that identity, call it a fictional or imaginary identity, I actually put a name on activity. I don't just 
make it up on no basis. So the activity, the particular activity of a dealer is to deal. And dealing in a game of cards involves stakes. There has to be something at stake in the game, you see? So you could say that dealing is also a metaphor or trope for transactions of power. Now, my specific role as a dealer is, <laughs> let me say, uh, it has an elaborate profile. So, I am a dealer in Kali's casino. Now, Kali owns the house. And I deal for the house, you see. And in particular, I deal at a table where you can come and play blackjack, or more specifically, black diamond jack. So that's my game, black diamond jack, also called 21. And I have a feeling that 2021 might be the year of my game. There's a saying in Planetary Tantra, fate is a dealer's game. So when you find yourself at any moment in front of your fate, it's really as if you're sitting across the table from me in Kali's casino, and I'm dealing. I'm always dealing your fate. Every time I say something, every time I describe or explain something, no matter what it is, somewhere within my words are the motions and the gestures by which I deal your fate. Now, if you think that's a pretty grandiose idea, if you think that it indicates that I have a grandiose notion of myself, well, yeah, sure. And it might indicate easily a case of megalomania, somebody whose self-importance is off the fucking charts. Well, that's me. But when I say I deal for the house in Kali's casino, and I deal fate. What if it's true? Then what difference would it make if it's grandiose or not? So everything I do and say, notice I'm being completely transparent. I dare anyone else to try transparency at this level. Everything I do and say, in some way, comes from an ultimate agenda. I'm a dealer of fate, and fate is a dealer's game. The house always wins. But the win can be to your great benefit. If Kali wins, due to the way I deal fate, that is to the benefit of the player. Sorcery can be an intricate affair, as Don Juan said to Castaneda. But why am I on this jag? Well, what I'm doing now is what I said, what I explained a moment ago. I'm gearing down. You see, I've got to go over there to the table at the other side of the room and dive into eight hours of revision of this book. Now, that takes intensity. But if I bring too much intensity, it will be difficult and unpleasant. I have to bring 
exactly the right measure of intensity to what I do so that I can do it impeccably and with pleasure. And so I'm talking to you now and I'm going to tell you a story about a whorehouse in Saigon. Why? It's a way for me to gear down and relax so that later I can turn to the task at hand and my intensity won't rip me to shreds. So here goes. Story about yours truthfully and his only encounter with a prostitute. Now I'm not into prostitutes at all and I really don't like the whole concept. I don't like the phenomena as it occurs in the world today and in my opinion a true man can't get true pleasure from a prostitute. The Sex is a transaction of power, but that transaction is rigged and ultimately it must be a cheating experience. But I've been fascinated or obsessed in one vein of my mythophrenia with prostitutes for quite a long time in my life. For instance, I've investigated and written extensively about what has been called sacred prostitution in the ancient world, the hieros gamos, the sacred wedding. And I've written extensively about that. And there was a time, I don't know, I was on a hell of a jag for, uh, fuck knows, I guess, 15 years. I had an obsession with Mary Magdalene. And I've written extensively about Mary Magdalene, uh, first on metahistory.org, and now that material is on Nemeta. I was obsessed with the figure of Mary Magdalene, and as a result of that, <laughs> I used to uh, play a little joke or maybe it's not such a joke. In my astrological career, I met a fair number of women who told me that they had been Mary Magdalene in a past life. I recall that Rudolf Steiner once remarked the same thing. I think he said that he had met 26 different women <laughs> who uh, told him that they had been Mary Magdalene. And women still write me and say, make that claim. And uh, how do I respond? Well, I don't. But a couple of times I've written back and, and said, uh, well, here's a name of uh, six or seven other women that told me that. And here are their email addresses. So why don't you all form the Magdalene Committee and figure out what the truth really is. But I played another joke, which was worse and rather wicked and cruel, but in an amusing way. Cruelty can be amusing. So clients would come to me and say that they were Mary Magdalene or women that I would meet in the New Age circles in Santa Fe or L.A. And they would usually present themselves in kind of a gushing, flowery manner as if this was a great revelation, and maybe, who knows, maybe it was a pickup line, was she inviting me uh, to get down and out with the reincarnation of Mary Magdalene. So when, several times actually, when a woman pulled that line on me and kind of suggested that she was flouting her sexual virtues. In my direction, I stood there deadpan. I counted two heartbeats, not three, and I said, you can't be. 
because I am. After that, the conversation took a rather different turn. But that's all fantasy material. And what I'm going to tell you now is about a real prostitute that I met once in Saigon during the Vietnamese War. Now, I was not there as a soldier. In fact, I was a draft dodger running around the Far East. But there was a series of passage boats that went from Marseille in France down across the Mediterranean, through the Suez Canal, across the Indian Ocean, and all the way to Yokohama, Japan, and all the way back again. That was called the Messagerie Maritime. And they had three big white boats. And it was a neat arrangement because you could get on the boat at Yokohama and you could get off in Hong Kong or Manila or Singapore. And then you could travel around that country and come back to the port and you could get on another boat. It didn't have to be the same boat because there were three boats that ran the circuit. So I arrived in Saigon on one of these boats. I think it was the Cambodge. And it was a beautiful, warm, cool fall evening, early fall in Southeast Asia. And I got off the boat down the gangplank and I walked into town and just kind of looked around, saw the cafes, saw many soldiers, many merchants, guys peddling around in their little rickshaws, food stands, exotic, charming place, chaotic. The sound of mortars and gunfire came up occasionally in the background. So I sat there at a cafe for a moment, having a cup of tea, and uh, I watched those Vietnamese lassies parade to and fro. Now, they have a national costume, do you know? I don't know if uh, they all dress in that costume now, considering that the world is going to rack and ruin and all the good and beautiful, simple customs of the human races are degenerating, thanks to you-know-who. Uh, but in those days, they wore the Ao Doi, the national costume for women. And this is a most elegant, elegant garment. It's made of diaphanous white cotton, so you can catch the outline of their bodies beneath it. And it comes all the way down to their ankles. It's formally cut in the top section with rather square shoulders. It's modest. It doesn't reveal the body of the woman. It does something more powerful. It suggests her body. It suggests the beauty of her figure and the grace of her movement. And so sexual beauty fumes out of the body of these lovely, thin Vietnamese girls and women on the street of Saigon, where I'm sitting. So I went there with the intention of doing just that, hooking up with a prostitute. And of course, that intention can be read very clearly in certain social situations. So I just sat there and looked around and made myself available. And sure enough, in no time at all, someone showed up, a rickshaw driver, pulled up his rickshaw to me, spoke a little broken English. I made it known to him what I was looking for. He said, climb in, and off we went. So he peddled me out a little bit on the outskirts of town to this large two-story house, which just looked like a big shack, really. 
And he left me off there, and we made an agreement that he would come and get me the next morning at 9 o'clock because I had to get back to the boat because we were sailing down to Singapore the next day. So I went in, and there was a madam, the manager of the joint. It was fairly early in the evening, around 9, and there were the whores, the Vietnamese whores. And they were all standing in the salon in the entry room. There wasn't really any action going on. So I had my choice. So the madam lined them up. They were clothes, but they were wearing almost like rags, you know, just like little skimpy cotton shorts and T-shirts or blouse. And they all stood there in a line. And I looked at one, and I said, I'll take that. And the madam said, who spoke broken English? All right, and she gestured to the girl. He stepped out of the line, and I turned to the madam, and I said, well, what's her name? And she said, her name is Jung, 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 Y-U-N-G. And I thought, that's a nifty name. So Jung and I climbed up the narrow staircase to the second floor, and there was uh, probably five or six rooms up there. They had no doors, only dirty blankets hanging in the doorway. She pulled aside one blanket, and I walked into a corner room that was completely dim. It had a dim light bulb hanging from the ceiling. No furniture, just a bed. And on the bed, there were no covers. It was warm. And uh, so there we were. This experience cost me five American dollars, by the way. So there I was with my $5 Vietnamese whore. And she immediately slipped out of her skimpy clothes and laid down on the bed, on her back. And I very carefully moved around the corner, the back corner of the room, very carefully took off my clothes, because I did have my wallet in my clothes, not that I had very much money, but I must have had a little. So I folded them very carefully and kind of tucked them in the corner to make sure that nothing would happen to my belongings. And I lay down beside her under the cheap, dim, bare light bulb. Now, in those days, I didn't know how to handle a woman. I was only 20. And I did not have the advantage I have today of knowing certain basic tantric principles about what I shall call the sexual dynamic. For instance, she powers, he steers. This is a fundamental formula of sexual tantra. I didn't know anything about it at the time. And I didn't know how to handle any woman or girl sexually. So, Jung was no exception. I absolutely didn't know what to do, how to approach her, or how to proceed. But anyway, I laid down beside her, on the bed, on my side, and I looked at her for a while. Let me tell you what I saw. She was about 5'4", and her skin was the color of dull copper and perfect everywhere. Her hands were like perfect living porcelain. Her neck was exquisite. She had really short hair. They all did. 
Her hair was particularly short, just come down around her ears. The others didn't have hair that was any longer than the nape of their neck. Just straight, unkempt hair. She had that kind of flat face, very accentuated, narrowed ovals for eyes, exquisite ears. And she was shapely, young and shapely and lovely from top to toes. Now, my Rigpa prompts me to wonder what age she was. And you might be thinking that she was pretty young. Now, I have to tell you that I have absolutely no pedophilic tendencies. On the contrary, my prescription for pedophilia is death. I have a solution, final solution for the plague of pedophilia on this world. And I can give it to you in two words, fish food. If I had my way, I'd herd them up in a truck, drive them onto one of those huge transport planes they use to drop off food supplies to starving Africans, fly it out over the Atlantic and dump them. No negotiation and no mercy. And I am certain that if she had been inappropriately young, I would have sensed it and it would have deterred me. But you know, these Oriental women can look young, even into their 30s, 40s, even into their 50s. It's astounding. Japanese women, Chinese women, in some cases, it's very difficult to tell what age they are. So as I lay there by her side, I'm pretty sure I must have reflected on that. And I must have wondered about her age. I was enchanted by her beauty. This naked, nubile creature. Now I'm not particularly prone to Asian women. I really don't go for Asian women. I prefer women of my own race and races. But there are exceptions. And there are examples, classical examples of Asian female beauty, which I think you would agree are absolutely breathtaking. And Jung, this poor little Saigonese whore, was really at that level in some respects. During the time that I spent in Asia, I looked at the women a lot. I had a couple of Japanese clutches, a couple of tangos with Japanese girls, Kiko and Nobuko, Nobuchan. But mostly I just looked at these women and I didn't really, I didn't really get excited. But I, when I left Asia, finally, and looking back on it, it seemed to me that the Vietnam women, Vietnamese women, were the most beautiful, classically beautiful, in their faces that I had encountered throughout my travels in Asia. So back to the bed. And what was going on? Well, nothing really. She made no gesture toward me whatsoever. She just laid there passively on her back. Well, having absolutely no idea how to proceed, I acted out of the natural affection that is innate to me. So I kind of reached over, sidled over, and took her into my arms just to hold her. Well, let's warm up. I don't know what's going how this is going to play out. But touch, warmth, contact. 
seemed like the obvious way to begin. She didn't have any particular odor, except kind of like a bed of wet flowers after the rain, when the density of the rain has saturated them, and in a way it's taken away the aroma of the flowers. And uh, so I smelled her neck. And just nestled her into my arms, and guess what? This I remember so vividly. She was as cold as a snake. Now I happen to like snakes, and I would probably have a snake, like a pet boa if I didn't have other animals. I really do like snakes, and I like the feel of a snake, that cold-blooded, slick, velvet feel. And that's exactly how she felt. She was as cold as a snake, and her nipples were cold, even colder than the rest of her body. So I kind of nestled her and, you know, made some prophetic gestures. But they were gestures of affection, which were completely inappropriate to the situation. Obviously, she was expecting me to do something to her, which I was not prepared to do without any signs of response. She powers... He steers. You see, in the tantric principle of sex, overpowering the woman is totally inappropriate because the woman is the ground of power, Shakti. And the role of the man is to steer the power. But in order for the man to steer the woman's power, which she can't handle on her own when it gets released into high intensities of pleasure, in order for the man to steer the woman through her own throes of pleasure, she has to offer her power. And obviously, Jung was offering nothing. So nothing happened. I just couldn't proceed. There was no possible way. And so I just stayed there. And I held her in my arms for a while. And I kept gazing at that, her skin. Dull, burnished copper. And all the details of her, every detail of her. And I put myself into a kind of a trance. And in that way, I guess you could say, I endeavored to profit from my investment of five dollars. And I stayed there all night. Now, I don't recall if she stayed with me. Probably not. I think at some point she got up and went downstairs and probably was handed off to other customers. But I stayed there in that room all evening. And it was uh, a quiet evening, except for the noise, occasional noise of mortars in the distance and some rat-a-tat-tat of uh, automatic gunfire around the house, not too close. Now, at one moment must have been close to midnight or later. I heard a big commotion downstairs. <laughs> and apparently some customers had come in. I didn't see them, but I gathered that it was a squad of grunts who had gotten off duty, and they decided to hit the whorehouse before they went back to their tents. And so... 
five or six soldiers came in. I did glimpse one of them. They were they were in battle gear. They had the, they had everything, weapons. They had backpacks, and they scrambled into these different rooms. They made a hell of a noise climbing up the stairs. These were big men, and then they each one each one of them went off into one of the side rooms, which I say had no doors, just dirty blankets hanging in the doorway. And they proceeded to uh, consort with these whores. And it was quite a raucous event. The, the thumping and the moaning and the grunting was hilarious. And it went on nonstop. And it was loud. And it went on for about, I don't know, half an hour or so. Quite entertaining. And then it got all calm. And then the morning came. I guess I might have slept a little. Somehow I knew what time it was. I don't know how. I've never worn a watch in my life. But I had to find out. I guess I went downstairs to find out what time it was so that I could keep my appointment with the rickshaw driver and get back to the boat. So it was really, really quiet. It was just a little after dawn. Put on my clothes. And I walked down the stairs, <laughs> back to the salon. And there, the madam was nowhere to be seen. There was kind of a kitchen corner with pots and a gas lighting stove or something. It was a shambles. And against one wall of the salon was a large platform. It wasn't a bed. It was a platform, I'd say. It's eight by ten feet. It had a mattress on it. Some shabby blankets scattered around and pillows. And on that platform, there lay, before my eyes, the five Vietnamese whores sleeping. And they were all sleeping on top of each other with their arms at different crazy angles, their arms akimbo, their legs twisted, their butts in one direction or another, their heads sometimes, one head on another's shoulder, one head on another's derriere. And I went over and stood there, and I thought, they look just like a litter of pigs. And I walked up very close, and I looked down at them. They were all sleeping sound. Not one of them stirred. A heap of five Vietnamese whores. And Jung was there, piled in with them. And it was like a little scene of a litter of pigs. And they were hairless pigs. The only thing you saw on the body of those creatures was the hair on their heads and very thin, fine eyebrows. Everything else in their anatomy was completely unconcealed. So I could see every nook and cranny of their bodies as they laid there in a heap. And I watched them. I couldn't tear myself away, actually. I had a strange feeling as I watched them, a kind of mixture of pity and affection and gratitude. And I relished that feeling. And then I walked outside and stood on the porch. And sure enough, the rickshaw driver pedaled up. And I got in. And he took me back to the boat. Enough said. I just needed to wind down a bit. And talking in this way is one of the methods that I use to do that. 
In this case, I've taken advantage of your attention to do that. And you can make of it as you like. And you can find me in the beauty to come.